Welcome everyone to Successful Iranians podcast and we're joined by a wonderful guest like we always are that is showcasing the great and the good but especially wonderful today and it's Dr. Emmy and Dr. Emmy is someone who specializes in helping patients effectively lose fat whilst becoming more youthful, more vibrant and more toned. That sounds about right but as we're coming into spring and summer. Uh, Dr. Emmy, I'll have some of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you've been involved in, in terms of your expertise in what's called neutrogenomics. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Could you talk to us about more about that and give us a full flavor and overview in terms of what you do, uh, your background today, so the audience understands who this person is in reducing fat and making us all youthful <laughs> and white. And toned. Yeah, so you know, um, nutrigenomics is actually the science of how genes or what we inherit affects our health and how we can tailor our lifestyle to best take advantage of what we've been given or the cards we've been dealt from a hereditary standpoint. So, a lot of what we talk about in nutrigenomics is basically turning genes on and off, knowing which genes you have that you don't want to have expressed and tailoring your lifestyle so that those genes aren't what is showing, figuring out what are advantageous to you and what you can highlight. And so that science is, it's probably doctors have been doing this maybe for the last 15 years. Um, the early tests came out like around 2007, 2008. The science has been much more refined since then. We know a lot more about things because there's a lot more studies done about these genes. And so it's, it's, very, it's very much like tailoring medicine and lifestyle to the person exactly, knowing you know, what their blueprint is like and what they will best respond to. In my field, that's been really helpful in weight loss because there's a lot of things that people inherit that keep them from getting to the body composition that they want. Body composition is very much inherited. There was a big study done back in the 90s where they took sets of 25-year-old twins and locked them up and overfed them for 12 weeks, gave them too many calories. And what they found was that the twins actually gained weight concordantly. So sets of twins pretty much gained the same amount of weight, all being fed this overfed diet. However, there was a vast difference between the sets of twins. So one set of twins gained no more than two kilograms and one gained 12 kilograms in that same amount of time. And so we know that these genetics affect things like our body composition, our health. Now we can really hone in on what those things are and actually help the person to tailor what they do to what's going to be most beneficial to them, not just from a weight loss standpoint, but from a health standpoint in general like what vitamins they should and shouldn't take, how they should and shouldn't exercise. Do they, is it advantageous for them to intermittently fast or are they a person that's going to be better off eating several small meals a day? So those are the kinds of questions that your genetics can answer. When you combine those tests with hormonal testing, general testing for you know your liver, your kidneys, uh, your blood counts, uh, testing for your food sensitivities and food allergies, your gut health, you can sort of build a complete picture that tells a person the roadmap they need to go for to be the most healthy. So it's a very, you know, it's an emerging science. It's not one that's really practiced in most practices right now, but it is the future. Absolutely fascinating um, and quite startling, actually. Um, yeah. You qualified to become a doctor by doing a medical degree. Um, right which must have pleased your parents. <laughs> your I come from a long line. Yeah, physicians, <laughs> very long line. So. <laughs> Unlike uh, the rest of us who are the black sheep in the family, as it were, who uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. something else, like That's green, right. green, 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 green. Um, Yeah. So offering, well done. Um, what then made you, after qualifying, to get, into this line of specialism? You know, what really struck you about it? So, you know, originally I started out like most physicians, you know, I did my residency, I started out in OBGYN, then I switched to internal medicine. 
uh, the program I was in was very intensive care oriented. So I came out, I had my own practice, but I also always worked in a hospital, taking care of really ill patients in the ICU, uh, in the hospital. So that was my career, but I myself had a lot of health challenges. Um, I was really overweight. I was pre-diabetic. I had a child on the autism spectrum. All of that led me to really want to explore more outside the world of conventional medicine. Because like for my son, I was told, you know, there's really nothing we can do to help you. And so changing his lifestyle actually changed his neurologic destiny in a way that no one really predicted or told me uh, in conventional medicine. I just happened to hear about, you know, this, this approach to treating kids on the autism spectrum, which involved diet. And so in trying to help him, I really learned a lot more about uh, this field called functional medicine, which is really going back to the root cause of why people have disease and looking at things at you know, a cellular level, at a biochemical level, uh, now in the nutrigenomic level. And then a few years into that, my dad had a heart attack. And at the time he was 67, he was not overweight, he was not diabetic, he'd had controlled blood pressure for many years. His cholesterol was picture perfect on no medication the day he'd gone into the hospital. Um, he was not a smoker. And so he is an engineer, a biomedical engineer, and he knew well about the risk factors for why someone would get a heart attack. And he asked his doctor, like, why did I have this heart attack? I really don't have any risk factors for it. And the doctor said to him, well, it's just because you're old. And he said, well, I don't accept that. I mean, you know, people in my family have had heart attacks, but they were either smokers and had them in their late seventies. My mom was 94. Uh, you know, I really shouldn't have had this happen to me at 67. So he was looking for answers. And at this time, a company that I was working with as an educator for other docs in the nutritional field came out with this test, which would test for your genetics and kind of tell you, you know, which vitamins were best for you and all of that. And when I did that test on my dad, I found out that he had a gene called MTRR. MTRR is a gene that takes something in your blood called homocysteine, which is harmful, and along a pathway of other genes, turns it into methionine, which is something your body needs. So if you have homocysteine hanging around, that causes a lot of inflammation in your vessels and can predispose you to heart attack, strokes, and dementia. The role of homocysteine was controversial for many years, but now a lot of societies that deal with strokes and heart attacks are saying you really need to work on lowering this if you find it. At that time, nobody knew. But his homocysteine was through the roof. I mean, people had guesses that this was a bad thing. I found this gene. I started treating him for that by giving him uh, the proper kind of B vitamins, which aren't the conventional kind. They're called methylated B vitamins. I gave him things to lower the inflammation in his vessels. And he, you know, never had another heart attack. He's now 82. So that was kind of the beginning of looking at that. And then I, I just thought, well, you know, if I'm doing this for my family, I really should educate myself more and be able to do this for my patients. And that's where it all started. So, yeah. And that was, you know, back, you know, 15 years ago or so. So. Obviously fascinating and quite alarming. Mm -hmm. um, my mom had a stroke and she was only what, only two, I got quite a young mom. She had me at 17. Very young, yeah. Yeah, and she was all fine, you know. Um, no, she was not overweight, no issues of any description. And in the end, after suffering from a lot of problems cardiovascular wise, it turned out that she had a hole in her heart. Oh, wow, yeah. Maybe a missing kind of link. But I'm fascinated with these kind of things, especially as you grow older in anti aging, mm -hmm. in terms of genetics, nutrition, all that kind of stuff. How much are you then a product of your environment in comparison to your genes? You've just given a good illustration of genetic effect. Right. Um, what, what would you say in terms of proportions with that? So there's a word that we use in the nutrigenomic field. That word is called epigenetics. And it's exactly kind of what I was talking about before. You can turn genes on and you can turn genes off. And your environment does that. Your lifestyle does that. So... You know, if you smoke, for instance, you turn on a set of genes that increase inflammation, you know, um, you change the biochemical pathways in your body. If you don't, then that does a whole different sort of thing to your genes. If you eat foods that um, contain, contain a lot of preservatives or free radicals, that's going to do a different thing to your genetic expression 
And if you don't, if you eat foods that are high in antioxidants and vitamins. So it's part of it is, is the lot you've been given, the cards you've been dealt. But then the nutrigenomic piece is really understanding how you can best use this deck of cards. Um, you know, what changes do you need to make to turn things on and off for yourself? For instance, I'll give you an example. The gene APOE4, that's a gene that increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So if you have one copy of this gene, the risk of Alzheimer's disease is two to three times the general population. If you have two copies, it's eight to nine times, even 10 times in some studies over the general population. Now, there's a study done in Finland looking at this, and people who had APOE4 who never developed insulin resistance or never had issues with blood sugar had a much lower chance of developing Alzheimer's disease, even if they had this gene. People who exercised in several studies, and there's both aerobic exercise and strength building exercise studied, tended to have a lower risk of progressing to dementia, even if they had this gene. People who socialized had a lower chance of developing Alzheimer's, even if they had this gene. Um, so there's multiple studies showing that this gene, even though it's sort of considered this death sentence for Alzheimer's, you can alter the expression, you can alter what happens to you, what we call phenotypically or in the real world, by the environment that this gene is placed in. In fact, in the developing world where people have very little food, people with this gene actually have a survival advantage. It's a gene that's really made for people who come from environments where there's not a lot of food, not a lot of fat in your diet, where you move all the time. So, you know, this gene at one point gave people a survival advantage. That's why this gene came to be. So it's really important to know if you have APOE4 because then you can modify your lifestyle, you know, to make sure that you don't express that gene in the worst way possible because it's not a guarantee that you'll get Alzheimer's. It just increases your risk. There's a lot of factors that play into what happens even if you have this gene. So it's really important to know your genetics so you can, you know, emphasize the right things in your lifestyle. Yeah, and I see the future of medicine being very much like that, where so I, I, I immerse myself with research with these kind of things. I don't know why, but I am fascinated by it. And you see a lot of science fiction become science fact. So True. I can almost envisage a world where you have like, some kind of copy of all your genes with your local doctor uh, where they load it up and say, oh, well, it's the reason why you've been this and that, you've got this gene. Which, uh, and then you've got all things like nanotechnology that might be all in your body, which alerts us <laughs> from different aspects. And, yeah, one day. Mm -hmm. yeah, but one now day. we can still do a lot just with yeah. diet and lifestyle, you know, without the attack. <laughs> that attack. It's yeah. coming because technology has come into me medicine in terms of med tech it, and and when it comes under a technology it comes under Moore's law where it doubles 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 and you see for example now with stuff that you can buy uh, aspects such as 23 and me is it uh, where you, you can you spit in something and it can give you the risk of certain aspects of maybe you're more prone to Parkinson's or you're more prone to this or you're more prone to that and I think some of these stuff that's been created was uh the google founders one of which i believe he found out they had a higher risk of parkinson's mm -hmm. so google and abby v created a company uh, which was around anti-aging and it was then combining that with uh, Ancestry.com and data sites where they can, they were looking at why people live to a certain age, you know, these centurions, super centurions, was it something in their lifestyle? You know, were they super healthy? You have that lady, the French lady, Jean Clement, I think she lived to about 125, something like that, the oldest person that we know on record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she smoked to a hundred years old. Um, and, she, and they found that a lot of these people that lived for a long, long time, they weren't like this bastion of absolute perfect shape, whatever. They had some, you know, they were a little bit overweight, but what they had, they had genes or a propensity to defend themselves against the causes of disease, uh, your longevity genes. Some of 
some kind of talk around that was around your telomeres. Mm-hmm. You know, those yeah, shimmers. there's the telomere yeah. length, yes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. some interesting people, Dr. Emmy, that are really quite pioneers in this is a guy called David Sinclair, and he does yes. a lot of mm-hmm. stuff around he anti-aging. Does. Yes, um, absolutely. He's wrong with it. Uh, uh, he came out with in terms of being an anti-aging thing. And that's the new bastion, isn't it? Where aging was always seen as an inevitable process. That's something you just have to put up with. Now with Aubrey de Gay as another guy uh, and David uh, uh, um, Sullivan, you know, these people that are really looking at aging as a way of the body's just got this software and they need to hack into it in terms of being able to make us not only live longer, but live more healthy. What's your thoughts on all of that in terms of anti-aging technology and all those kind of aspects? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. And that's what I do in practice, actually, is really help people hack into what is, you know, their particular code. Um, And I marry it with where they are right now. So I look at their hormones, their general labs, you know, their gut health. Um, their food sensitivities and food allergies sort of paint a complete picture with the genetics. So it's sort of, you know, and a lot of times the genetics do gives a, do give us aha moments, things that we just didn't understand in the past. Like, you know, why is this person getting these repeat infections? For instance, we can look at certain genes in the gut that predispose you to that. Um, and then we know what to do about it. Um, and so, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not something that's out in the general public, but people like David Sinclair are pioneers in that. And some of the work that he's done, I've actually implemented (laughs) Um, and seen some pretty amazing results with things like resveratrol or uh, NMN, which he talks about in a lot of his literature. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I think that day is coming and that's what functional anti-aging is about. It's not about the superficial, like, you know, get Botox and make yourself look younger. It's about what are you doing on the inside for your cellular health to make sure that you're functional, that your brain continues to function. Like I'm 54, I don't have a single ache or pain. You know, I could wear a bikini on the beach. I can dance the night away, you know? And I think, you know, 30 years ago, people didn't think of people in their fifties as as that person. Um, But now it's very possible for everyone to really tap into that. Uh, And I started as a very sick person. Like in my thirties, I was so ill, I could barely get out of bed in the morning but it was really figuring out what was going on with me that really inspired me to try to do that for my patients. Cause I was like, well, you know, a lot of people are in that same camp where they're lost, they're ill and they can't find their way back to health in the conventional system. Yeah. I mean, I'm well done, uh, in doing that. Mm-hmm. And it, it leads me on to, well, wasn't it Hippocrates that said all diseases start in the gut? Yes. And he was quite right. <laughs> so my friend, Dr. D. Mason, she's a naturopath who's also quite well known in nutrigenomics. And her mantra is, you know, the road to good health is paved with good intestines. And in holistic medicine, we totally believe that. It's something that's been lost in the way that medicine is conventionally practiced now, but it is really it. And for me, the reason my gut was so unhealthy is I had rheumatic fever as a kid. And back then, it would put you on years of antibiotics for that. I see a lot of women in my practice that had years of antibiotics for things like acne. So nobody looked at, you know, what was causing this acne? How can we make this better by changing our lifestyle? They were just simply given antibiotics for many years. And so, you know, now they're dealing with the ramifications of what that has done to the microbiome or the, you know, uh, bacteria, fungi in their gut what that has done to the lining of their gut and then ultimately what it's doing for inflammation in their body. And you sort of have to go back and look at what's going on with their gut health and kind of rebuild a healthy gut, which takes time and work, but it's really worth it. Yeah. And it, it leads me on as well. There's a lot of research coming. I watched some of these uh, programs around the gut and diet. I can't mm-hmm. remember the guy's name, but he was talking about lectins. Oh, yes, you're talking about Dr. Gundry. Yes. Um, yes. Gundry, he was saying that, like in the animal kingdom, everyone has kind of a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. So is the case with chemical war- warfare with kind of plants. Mm-hmm. And we're consuming these lectins, which are causing a lot of damage. Then there's scientists and doctors that look at 
what he says and are quite skeptical of it. And they say he's not based in that much sound science. What's your thought? Um, I think that he has some points. Um, I think, you know, you can see, for instance, like traditional cultures, you always soak your legumes. Why is that? Because it reduces the lectins. <laughs> So you don't get the same gas, you know, you can pressure cook legumes to get rid of the lectins. So I think there is a point at which lectins can be pretty harsh on the gut. But there's also some data that they are helpful for certain things like cancer prevention. So I think it's a balance between, you know, where your gut is. If you have an unhealthy gut, definitely high amounts of lectins can really cause a lot of gas because your microbiome cannot handle it. Um, and so for people that have that ill gut, limiting lectins and uh, might be helpful. Um, you know, you'll notice people um, who have healthy guts though can probably eat those things without a huge issue. So I think it's it's not for everyone, but I think it can be a problem. Um, there's an old variant of what he's talking about, which is called the FODMAP diet, the fructooligosaccharide diet, which actually looked at these certain kinds of sugars that get fermented in the gut into gas and limited those in people who had GI disease. So his idea isn't entirely new. Um, but I think, you know, I, I don't believe it to the extreme maybe that, that he talks about it, but I do think it is a factor for some people for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on top of that, there's a lot of talk when it comes to, I've seen people like Joe Reagan, uh, Reagan, um, on his podcast, talk about how he limits calorie intake. And mm -hmm. Fasting is proven by studies as one of the most effective ways to increase maybe longevity and lifespan in animals, etc. If you limit calories, and that's why fasting can be good for you. Uh, I've got, for example, Gilbert syndrome, which mm -hmm. means that, you know your bilirubin's levels are a little bit more elevated, and bilirubin was seen as something which was very toxic. You know jaundice, et cetera. And then studies later down the line showed actually it was a, a, a very, it was a highly effective anti-inflammatory and a high antioxidant product that mm -hmm. could have benefits in terms of cardiovascular or other, uh, other aspects. And it did mimic fasting because when you fast, apparently your levels of bilirubin go up mm -hmm. um, to mimic that. So what's your, um, what's your thoughts on calorie intake and um, all of this kind of, uh, as, all these kind of aspects that's becoming very popular with certain celebrities that, oh, I only had a coffee all day and uh, uh, I just have a little bit of food at the end of the night and I work out like crazy and I feel absolutely great and uh, I never look better. Yeah, I, uh, I think again, it's, it's highly genetic. So if you have APOE4, for instance, calorie restriction will help you. If you have APOE2, not so much. These are cholesterol transport proteins. Um, so we're all designed for certain things. And then there's certain thrifty genes that actually may backfire if you calorie restrict too much because they're just going to think that you're in starvation mode and start hanging on to fat. So again, it all depends on your particular genetics. Um, certain genetics um, make it so that fasting is advantageous and others don't. So um, if we know your genetics, then we can answer that question better for you. There's definitely people who do better with small meals during the day, uh, you know, small 200 to 300 calorie meals during the day and not a lot of calorie restriction, whereas others do fantastic with fasting. There's also people who um, will spike their cortisol more if they fast. So if you have a gene called COMT, carboxyomethyltransferase, which is a gene that gets rid of fight or flight hormones, cortisol and estrogen, um, if you have a slow variant of that gene, then you're likely to spike cortisol when you intermittently fast, and it will not have as good an effect for you as someone who has a very fast version of the gene that gets rid of cortisol quickly when it spikes when they fast. So it's very much an individual answer like everything else. So I just, I have never written a book that, that tells people to eat a certain way or a certain diet because that answer is so individual. And when I do write my book, it's really going to be about finding out about who you are as an individual. What are those factors that you need to look for? What genes are you looking at uh, to figure out, you know, what to do? Because there's just no one size fits all answer. What's poison for one person can be panacea for another and vice versa. I mean, there's certain things that are universal, like not eating foods with a lot of preservatives that are free radicals. 
um, you know, not eating inflammatory oils like high omega-6 oils. Most human beings don't do well with that. But for the most part, almost all answers are individual. And that's something I've come across in social media because people are like, well, why aren't you giving us the answers? And it's like, well, that's because the answers are tailored to you. They're not anyone else's answers for the most part. And personalized medicine is definitely the future, isn't it? It way. definitely is, yeah. We're moving more and more that way. As more, I mean, hopefully more physicians will get more educated about it and, and want to do more of it because it's very rewarding to really tell people about them. And, you know, from a philosophical point, it links you back to your ancestors because you really understand that, um, you know, uh, there's certain genes that, for instance, are more prevalent in certain populations and others, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's nice to know those things. Yeah, I mean, even the way medicine is going to be delivered is going to be personalized. Because um, mm -hmm. it's always it's always been quite strange to me how everyone gets the same antibiotic or the same, right. despite different cultural or genetic or whatever. Um, and isn't it true that we're made up more of bacteria than anything else? And it's the bacteria side of things that actually can cause illnesses by being out of zinc and not having enough good bacteria. And that is it 65% or something of our immune system is in the gut. And that yes. the way, the way that the messaging happens uh, have, uh, from the brain to the gut and the immune system, if you can talk us more through that, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So you're speaking of the microbiome which is, you know, the bacteria in our gut. And they are a huge part of our mass, um, you know, and, and they are, they are, there are more cells of them than there are cells of us in our body. Um, and so they are very much the symbiotic or can be the symbiotic creature for us unless they get out of whack. So they make a lot of our vitamins, they digest a lot of our food, they do signal our brain. And the problem is that when they get out of whack, when we get these disadvantageous bacteria or yeast uh, in large numbers that shouldn't be there, then the signals for our brain actually can change too. So for instance, if you have an abundance of yeast in your gut that you should not have, like candida, which is, should be there in small numbers, but not large numbers, that can start signaling your brain to crave sugar more. Um, so even the signals that go to your brain really have a lot to do with your microbiome. And it's increasingly actually being implicated in, you know, obesity. In fact, there was this groundbreaking study where they took, um, you know, these uh, rodents which had a knockout gene for, um, for uh, that made them diabetic. They're called the fat diabetic rat because they have a certain gene that that predisposed them to be overweight and diabetic. And these rats uh, had their microbiome removed and put into these genetically thin rats, and the thin rats microbiome was removed and transferred into the fat rat. And what happened was that they actually switched body types <laughs> by switching their microbiome. So the microbiome is becoming increasingly known to affect all these hormonal signals in our body, including, you know, what happens to our weight, our muscle and fat ratios and things like that. Well, that's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And when it comes to like um, anti-aging, you know, everybody wants the fountain of youth, don't they? You know? Yes, they do. <laughs> and in history, they used to look at young people's blood because they thought, oh, if I inject myself with a young person's blood, then I'll be able to rewind the clock. And then it got further down the line where people were looking at telomeres and everything else. And, oh, let's just elongate the telomeres, but then the side effect was cancer, et cetera, they could do that. Um, and then now fasting, calorie uh, restrictions, um, mm -hmm. calorie in uh, intake. Um, now we've got a crisis all around the world, especially in the Western world, where the good thing is we're living longer. The negative is that we're having more and more kind of unhealthy. Uh, one, we're having more of an unhealthy lifestyle. And two, is a lot of more unhealthy things that develop as we grow older because aging is one of the biggest factors to disease, right? And it's placing so much pressures on our health systems. Yeah. So it's going to now come to a point where the anti-aging movement led by 
uh, Sinclair and Aubrey de Gay and other people like um, uh, the likes of Google and some of these entrepreneurs, Jeff Bezos is getting in on it in Silicon Valley where they, uh, you know, being billionaires want to live forever. Why not? You know, they're having a great life, etc. cetera, where um, it's been, they're going to become an imperative to do something about these aging or not aging, but more uh, these diseases that get much more likely as we age because our body starts to break down. Where do you see anti-aging going moving forwards? I mean, you're right. You know, it could have a huge economic impact if you could make people really prolong the span of which they are productive, for one thing. <laughs> Um, you know, like I see myself working into my seventies and eighties without a problem. So that's one thing is, you know, you don't have retirees that are like drawing on the system because they're still productive and working. And second of all, you know, you don't have people pressuring, putting pressure on the hospital because now they have all these chronic diseases that then lead to more chronic diseases, like, you know, high blood pressure and diabetes leading to strokes and heart attacks and heart failure and kidney disease and, you know, taxing the system. So. I think it is really a practical thing. I mean, right now it's seen as a luxury item for people who can afford it, but really it is something that it would behoove anyone who has an aging population to look at because you're correct. I mean, it would make a huge economic impact going forward as far as, you know, the burdens placed on those who are younger working to support those who are aging and developing diseases much younger than they really should. Yeah, I just remember that Google company is the uh, collaboration between ABB and Google. They created a company called Calico. Calico, mm -hmm. that's been, um, that really involved in a lot. And that's through self-interest because he's got a gene that he might get Parkinson's more. And why not if you're a billionaire, you want to solve your own problem, right? Um, right. It starts with that, solving your own problem. You talk about diabetes a lot, um, which is mm -hmm. known to reduce your lifespan on average by seven or eight years. And yes, then there's please. this drug called metformin, which has mm -hmm. been around for a long time. And there's something being done where people are trying to push for that to be the first anti-aging drug FDA approved because they, they've shown studies that people on metformin, even though if you have diabetes, which on average you should live seven to eight years uh, less, they're actually living the same maybe one or two years more, but there's something more going on, maybe an anti-aging effect. What's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, metformin is an interesting drug because no one really knows exactly how it works. They think it has effects on the microbiome. In my practice, I actually use a natural supplement. Uh, and again, I'm not advocating people go out and buy this without working with a physician, but I use berberine, which has studies which are quite similar uh, and berberine also affects the microbiome. It reduces things like candida. It increases the number of good bacteria in the gut. Uh, it's been shown to reduce insulin resistance, make people more insulin sensitive, um, lower blood sugars. Now it does react with a bunch of medications also. So again, please don't go out and buy berberine. And also berberine is tricky. It has to be wild crafted and come from good places to really have the same effects. And a lot of what's sold over the counter is not the great stuff. It's stuff that's, you know, farmed in China or uh, Oregon grape, which is not the same as the Ayurvedic uh, or actually traditional Persian medicine berberine, uh, which is wild crafted. Um, and so that's what I've been using in my practice for many years uh, outside of, you know, prescribing someone metformin. It's much better tolerated by the gut. It doesn't tend to cause as much diarrhea. It might in the beginning if people get a little bit of yeast die off, but in general, it's much better tolerated than metformin from a gas and gut standpoint. And so that's kind of my traditional, you know, I think in our society, we've sort of forgotten a lot of what the old wisdom knew. <laughs> and that this was used for many years in traditional Chinese, the medicine of India, the herbal medicine of Iran uh, in treating people with uh, blood sugar issues and, and for longevity. And so it is something that actually the studies show works pretty well. So that's what I've been using sort of as my little answer to metformin. When I was pre-diabetic, I was offered metformin, but I just couldn't fathom as hard as I was working, having those GI side effects that you can get from it. And so I was like, I'm really looking for something more natural to do in that way that may not have the same side effects. And that's where I, that out about berberine and sort of how, you know, 
uh, how to find the, the good ones and that sort of thing. So. I love the way your mind is because it's outside of the box. It's critical thinking at its best. It's looking at being on top of your brief, knowing a lot of the science as well as knowing other things that you can do. Because what I found with dealing with a lot of doctors, you know, I had a lot of eye issues, for example. Um, it was pretty much do what they've always said from the textbook, state the same kind of prescriptions and process. And they, they say that, uh, another quote from Hippocrates, you know, they say the best doctor is yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you, when you have something, whether it be diabetes or an eye issue and it becomes chronic. And if you're a research obsessive like me, you look at every single aspect and you're on top of every single study or whatever you Google it, because we all become more intelligent we? Because, because of, uh, and the way that our brain is almost geared into a, a, a more enhanced intelligence where you can just get all of the stuff and, and then try to look at it, even though still see a doctor, still see a professional because you can have the facts, but it's, it's, it's important to qualify that. Um, but I love the way you, you, you think more of a disruptor and an innovator. Uh, as well as someone who's so scientifically brilliant um, in, in, in your understanding of things. Um, and it leads me on to diet because you mentioned some points there. And I've seen a lot of chefs, for example, in the UK, uh, the likes of Jamie Oliver uh, and others, where mm -hmm. they've gone around the world why certain populations live for a particularly long time. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, the Japanese is at the top of that. And there's a particular place in Japan. I think it begins with Y, some kind of town. Oh, Okinawa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. See, I told you, folks, that Dr. Amy's really on top of our brief uh, mm -hmm. on everything. Um, so he looked at that, and then he was looking at as well um, Sardinia is disproportionately yes. had more super uh, centurions. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about rosemary in mm -hmm. Sardinia, that's maybe a missing link to it. And then they talk about other aspects like the rainbow diet, etc. What's your thoughts on all of these things and how much of it is based on fads and coincidence to actual science hardcore facts? You know, what's so interesting about these super aging populations, what they call blue zones in the world, is that they do have these particular things that they eat and do. Uh, but you know, I don't think it can be generalized to everyone because they just happen to have found the things that work best for their genetics. So for instance, I know in Sardinia, there's a certain soup that has barley in it that everyone eats. Well, not everyone in the world does well with barley. I mean, we don't all have the genetics to do great with barley. So, you know, part of that is looking at your ancestral diet um, also, because what made, made your people super agers, and I happen to, Actually, part of my heritage, my dad comes from a long line of Jewish doctors who were actually physicians to the Persian court. But my mom comes from a tribe called the Lors. They're nomadic herders that were on the western side of Iran for many years. And they live into their 120s. You know, they're not recorded because no one knows exactly when they were born. But, you know, they, they are known to live a very, very long time. And they eat basically, you know, things that they gather as nomadic herders uh, and you know, goats and sheep, basically. And that's the diet that does well for them. Uh, they're not people that eat a lot of grain, for instance, because that's not part of their nomadic diet. So I think for me, what I found is grains didn't do really well for me because I come from this very nomadic background. And, you know, that uh, city diet of grains, which they eat in Sardinia, which has rye, probably wouldn't help me to age very well. But in Sardinia, for those people, their genetics, it works really well. The Japanese in Okinawa, they have this sort of sweet potato-ish type thing that actually really lowers blood sugar. Um, I eat the noodles that are that are derived from that, um, and it's it's quite good. Um, but you know, it's suited for their genetics, and may or may not be suited to other people's genetics. So I think these blue zones, people try to generalize these foods like we should all be eating these foods, but really you should look at your own ancestral diet to see what helped your ancestors a long time first. Uh, and then maybe take some things from those blue zones that may fit your genetics or your, you know, profile. But I don't think you can generalize like what each 
place eats to you necessarily if their genetics are quite different. And how would you do that? How would you go about understanding your genetics apart from doing an ancestry.com thing which just tells you what, you know, I did it when I uh, sat into it and then it tells you, well, you could be from this region and that region and that region. And it was like, no, no. <laughs> It specifically. I want to know specifically. Well, I mean, doing research is big. And of course, being an old world person, being Persian, it's a lot easier to, to do that research because people kept oral records of who they were and where they came from. Um, so that's, you know, that's all easier. But for people that are in the States, it's a little harder because it's such a mixed mash. So you have to probably do some genetic testing. Um, you know, the ancestral testing is helpful. I also think nutrigenomic testing specifically, like the test that I use is called self-decode, and it really looks at all these different genes of what foods you would do best with, what, uh, you know, kind of diet, should it be a more fat diet for you, or should you eat more carbohydrates, or should you have more protein? So a lot of these things we know from nutrigenomic studies, you know, these genes will help if you eat like this diet or that diet. So I think it's a combination of both looking at your ancestors and also looking at where your genes are right now, because a lot of people are a mix. You know, even for an old world person, I'm very much a mix. So my mom's lower tribe actually mixed with some of the descendants of Genghis Khan. So I have a little bit of, you know, East Asian in me. Um, you know, my dad uh, with the, you know, uh, Jewish genetics, I mean, uh, the, or Jewish ethnicity. I mean, they had different uh, people from different parts uh, that came together. So, you know, we're all sort of a mix of different people. So looking at your own genes specifically is really important as well as looking at your ancestry. But I can tell you like in North America, one of the things that's been super tragic is for instance, what's happened on reservations where people are given like wheat and cheese, things were, that were never part of their diet. And, you know, people eat like fry bread with cheese. Like that's not something that their ancestors ever ate or were used to. And so it's like this foreign thing being introduced into their body that their genetics has never seen before. And you can see, um, you know, this this example of the Pima tribe, half of which lives in New Mexico and gets, you know, government subsidized food from the United States government and half of whom live in Mexico and eat their traditional diet of this traditional corn, which has nothing to do with the kind of corn that's raised commercially, uh, that's treated with lime and a lot of legumes and vegetables. And this group in Mexico that lives in agrarian subsistence lifestyle has no diabetes, no uh, you know, health issues are all thin and people with the same genetics across the board are eating, you know, the American diet are almost all overweight. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about, like looking at your ancestral diet and what you're supposed to eat versus what we all are now eating in the world sort of uniformly. <laughs> so. It's really fascinating. Um I'm half British, half Iranian Kurdish, and my dad used to always talk about his great uncle who lived to 120. He said he was a farmer and he used mm -hmm. to have a yoga every day, and you hear all of these kind of stories, don't you? And, and when I mentioned about Sinclair, Ravastrol, it's to do with the national fruit of Iran, anar, pomegranate. Yeah, pomegranate. So, yeah, yeah, lots of resveratrol. <laughs> I'll be able to go, yeah, but you'd have to have huge concentrations. But there was a pill that people were taking, like Ravastrol, supplement pill, wasn't it? Um, yes. And then you, re you recommend some other things as well uh, on that. Um, because you can look at your blood in terms of biomarkers, can't you? Uh, in, where, how, Absolutely. How fast you. Um, so talk us a little bit about that. But I just want to ask, people think, oh, right, therefore I, I, I can't have any treats. I can't then have chocolate or pastas. I'll have to just stick to my ancestral diet. Is it as black and white as that? Or you can indulge in some dark chocolate sometimes and uh, a cheeky taco or whatever your 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 fancy. Yeah, I mean, I would say I have a ninety ten rule. So I ninety percent eat good and ten percent cheat. <laughs> but I, you know, I confine my cheats to like a half day a month or something like that. I don't really go crazy with my cheats. Because I really want my diet to overall be what it's supposed to be, which is, you know, grass-fed organic lamb and, you know, vegetables. Um, but, um, or, you know, a, a really good, um, you know, bone broth with, and I use the shirataki noodles, the Japanese, uh, you know, root noodles, instead of regular noodles, because I don't do well with grain. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I think you can indulge once in a while, really good, beautiful food. Um, but, uh, you know, just be careful. <laughs> Don't do it all the time. Uh, and try to really, you know, look at what diet would be best for you versus everyone else. Yeah. So there's like not one diet that's, you know, I had one patient who, I mean, she went vegan and that's when she developed kidney stones because um, she was getting all her calcium from green leafies that had a lot of oxalates and she wasn't able to get rid of oxalates. And so, you know, her vegan diet is actually where her kidney stones came from. So in working with her, I did not put her on a vegan diet. <laughs> um because, you know, that for her was, was an issue. Um, and so again, it's really important to look at a person and all of their situation and coming up with what's best for them. But yeah, pomegranates are my favorite also. I love it. So. And biomarkers, because there are some people that claim that they can, within 99% accuracy, they say, mm -hmm. how long you're gonna live. Yeah, I think that's a little much because you don't always know everything. Would you want to know them, Benny? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how. I mean, I've seen my patients who've done those tests and they're, uh, I don't know, I think they're kind of a little bit of a marketing gimmick. I mean, there are things that you can look at. Vascular inflammation is a biggie. So if people have elevated, um, you know, myeloperoxidase antibodies, elevated, um, uh, sorry, elevated myeloperoxidase, rather elevated TMAO, which is another broad vascular inflammation, elevated homocysteine, elevated highly sensitive CRP. You're looking at, you know, risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke that aren't normally looked at in the general medicine that can actually be quite important. So I do believe in looking at those biomarkers. A lot of people don't know that, for instance, it's oxidized LDL and not just your plain LDL that makes, you know, your bad cholesterol makes a difference because if you don't have oxidized LDL, if you don't have that damaged bad cholesterol, it's never going to, you know, break apart and cause clot. Um, whereas if you have a high proportion of this oxidized LDL, it will. And a lot of these things you can test for them, but nobody really does in the general clinics. So I do believe in biomarkers from that standpoint. I just don't think you can always predict everything from them. You can predict a lot, but I wouldn't say 99%, I'd say maybe 80%. Um, what's more important, triglycerides or, or cholesterol? I mean, they're I mean they're all important, but um, because blood tests I found in the UK are getting more um, detailed. So mm -hmm. before like, twenty years ago, it was just a little bit more basic in terms of the main aspects. Now they 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 get more kind of biomarkers or whatever they're looking at. What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, looking at the components of cholesterol is everything. I mean, if you look at someone's just general old style cholesterol, like what's their LDL, what's their HDL, what's their total, you're going to miss a lot because a lot of it has to do with what those particle sizes are like. The importance of high triglycerides is actually, they're usually one of the first markers for insulin resistance. So years before someone's sugar goes up, their triglycerides can go up. And that's the issue where, you know, it's, it's showing you that they're not handling, they have insulin resistance generally is what the triglycerides are showing. In fact, you know, diabetes starts out as a fat disease that then becomes, you know, a sugar disease. So there's a marker called LPIR, uh, which actually looks at insulin resistance by looking at the sizes and composition of fats in your blood. And that marker is much more sensitive than, you know, just looking at sugar because it, goes out normal years and years before your sugar does. So I had a 25 year old woman come to see me who was gaining weight, thyroid and everything was normal, but this LPIR was elevated. So she was, was developing insulin resistance, even though she'd been a thin person before, everything else on her blood work looked good. Um, but you know, this genetic insulin resistance was kicking in for her very early. So that's, those sophisticated tests are super important because they actually help us predict risk way before you know the old style testing does that's for sure yeah uh, cardi um, cardiologists often say the problem uh with what i do is that when i get the patients coming to me already the damage has been done correct and you yes, know that's it's, it's prevention better than cure isn't it you know it's harder much better so it's been a fascinating discussion we're coming more towards the end of the, uh straight of this podcast Mm -hmm. So you've been this incredible doctor. I, I, I found 
so much of what you said, just so insightful. And I'm someone who takes these things quite seriously, as anyone in my family will tell you. Um, how did you then transition to be somewhat of an influencer on Instagram with a huge following? You know, did that come naturally or talk us through about that? You can obviously talk, you can see the science and, and your expertise but, uh, on this podcast, but I'd love to see the, uh, the transition of your career and how you evolved. So it took a long time. Uh, I have a great social media uh, gal, Taylor uh, Morgan, helping me, uh, who herself was a small, you know, she was a smaller influencer, like a 15K ball. Person, but she actually really um, tapped into what people wanted to hear about, and that's what really helped, you know, catapult me to where I got, uh, you know, on the Today Show and all that. Was I did a video called on TikTok called Five Things I Would Always Do as a Doctor Who Lost a Hundred Pounds, and it was not the usual advice people give for weight loss. And I think that's what really resonated with people because a lot of people are frustrated with the usual advice because they really can't lose any weight with the usual advice. And so, you know, what I'm trying to do is really bring that information to people in a way that's digestible. Uh, and I think that's really what the key to success is. I mean, I don't have any gimmicks. Uh, usually it's just me talking, but I try to give people the information that they're not hearing from the general sources, but that's really going to be helpful to them if they can get to it. And, you know, really educating people about what personalized medicine means and what they can do in their life to figure out, you know, the key to themselves. And I think that's really the, the big key there in social media is really providing that value. And did it come naturally? Like Pretty much. I mean, I was a speech and debate person in high school. Um, you know, <laughs> my family are big debaters. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my maiden name, my Persian last name is Karosh. So the Karosh family is known for, you know, being like, oh, you know, having their opinions and, and uh, debating, and that's how I grew up. So yeah, speaking comes really naturally to me. I love doing it. And so what was success? Because we've, we've touched on that a few times. Uh, we talked about personalization, you know, each their, their own, um, and success. What does that look like to you? What's, what's your mission and purpose moving forwards? What, what do you want to have? to be what, to be known for your legacy with all of this? Well, I mean, I think, I hope that I come to be known for empowering people to find out about themselves and their own health. Um, especially, you know, my fellow women, I think many times are overlooked in the medical system, but also men, I've met a lot of men that have had more unusual issues that have been overlooked. So really looking out for yourself personally uh, and getting to your, you know, your best health. Uh, from a practical standpoint. That's really the legacy that I want to leave behind. I hope that one day I can return to Iran also and bring, you know, personalized medicine to Iran. I had to leave when I was nine years old. My family are members of the Baha'i faith, highly persecuted in Iran. Mainly, uh, a lot of it comes from our stance on the equality of women and men uh, and our stance that you don't need clergy to get close to the divine. Uh, two things that are not really, you know, embraced by the Iranian mullahs. And so, um, you know, I hope that one day my family and I will be able to return to Iran and bring that, that personalized medicine and, and the, the science um, that, you know, actually a lot of medicine originated in Iran. You know, the first textbook in medicine was written by Evan Sina, a Persian. So, you know, bringing that science back to kind of the place where it started. So. Yeah, I totally agree. And there was a chilling documentary about what happened with the Baha'is on BBC. Actually, you find them on YouTube, um, a video they found mm -hmm. interrogating them, um, which then shivers down your back. Yeah. So if people listening to this will be thinking, right, I've got to do something about my diet now. Or, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and whether I'm poisoning myself or actually helping my, myself. That's How right. Can they get in touch with you to, to, to help them on that journey? So my favorite way to communicate with people is actually Instagram DMs. I love the Instagram DMs because you can actually pull video into it. If somebody asks you a question and you have a video on it, you can put it there. Um, a lot of the common questions, you can have your replies set uh, so that, you know, you have a 
very composed reply because a lot of the questions that people have are, you know, similar. Um, so yeah, my Instagram is at doctor spelled out dot EMI. I'm also on TikTok with the same moniker. And then my website is Dr. Emmy, just one word, dot com. So if you want to reach me, I, either of those places is great, but Instagram is really the best. It's my favorite. So. Yeah. And do catch Dr. Emmy on that. And a huge following and we'll put in the notes on the podcast. Well, I really learned a lot and it, I've taken a lot of questions in my head that I want to investigate after this. Um, Absolutely. So me, it's been one of the most insightful interviews that I've had with any me medical practitioner. Um, so I want to thank you for your time and for coming on the Successful Iranian Podcast. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. I think, you know, so many people don't know about the great heritage that Iran has brought to the world in the world of science and the world of medicine and the world of business and the world of spirituality, you know, in the world of poetry. And so having this podcast, I think, and introducing people to this great culture that is currently not represented the best in the world is so important. I agree with that. What a good way to end the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it.